because there's often lots of information, and it's hard for me to remember what I spoke about last week, and I imagine it'll be hard for you as well. So those are there for for you to take, if they'll be helpful for you, and they're online as well. If you are there at home, you can go over to our website. There may be a place right there in the feed that you can look for those notes. Every year, I call three people and make an appointment. One of those three people is my dentist. Every year I go to see her, and she does x-rays, which happened just last week, checks over my teeth, cleans things up, reminds me to continue to floss, and fixes anything that might be problematic or something that may be on the edge that she can address. Another appointment that I make every year is with my physician. And I go to see him, and he prods, and he pokes, and he asks questions, and he draws fu- <laughs> uh, uh, fluids from, <laughs> from my body and tests those things out, making sure that my physical body is okay. The third person I visit every year <laughs> is another doctor, my skin doctor, because our family has a history of skin cancer. And she asks me questions, and she looks me over to make sure that everything is okay. And I appreciate these three people because each one of them helps for me to understand what I need to do, what might be going in a bad direction, encourages me to do what's right, and does an assessment on this physical body as I continue to progress with it. This morning, we're going to do an assessment as well. It's going to be assessment from the Word of God as we look to Genesis chapter 18. And I'm going to be asking us, I believe the Lord is asking us, three questions. And the points this morning are in forms of questions. It's a spiritual diagnosis to see how we're doing spiritually. Now, we usually, hopefully, take care of these bodies, but we know that these bodies will perish will be raised imperishably when Christ comes. But what's of even greater importance is our spiritual health, our mind and what we choose to focus on, our actions and how we live these things out. So it is good for us to go to the great physician, which is Christ today, and allow him to ask us some questions. And so as we go through this, there's three main questions. There are going to be some other questions. I want us to be, and this is how I've been praying for this morning, to be reflective, to be responsive, to be honest, and look at our hearts as we look to God's word for each and every one of us. So if you remember in our story, and we are working through the life of Abraham from the book of Genesis, last week after... 13 years of silence, God came and visited with Abram again. And in that conversation, he reminded Abram of what he had previously told him. This was the fifth time where he reminds him of his promise, saying, it's going to be really close now, Abram. And he changes his name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, identity shift as in father of a nation. He asked Abram to receive the, co- the sign of the covenant, demarking him and the generations after him who would receive God's promise as being set apart for the Lord. He also told now Abraham about his wife, Sarai, which he changed her name as well to Sarah, from princess to my princess, saying, Abram, I want you to know, Abraham, that this promise is going to be by my spirit. And since your body is as it was dead, and since she is unable to conceive, I'm going to do a miracle in your bodies for this child." Who are you to call Isaac, which means he laughs or laughter. God then left Abraham, and Abraham went and fulfilled 
the sign of the covenant through circumcision. And so we now pick up this story in chapter 18, verse 1. And God now is visiting him and must be visiting him within three months of when he reminded him what was imminent, what was going to happen. Because Sarai, or Sarah, was not pregnant when God again came to him. And from this opening passage, this is the first question I'm asking. I believe God is asking, how is your relationship with God? How is it with you and Him? And we'll see from this passage from Abraham some healthy dispositions of his heart towards God and then reflect upon where our heart is. So this is Genesis 18, starting with verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. This is where he has been camping out. And while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent, in the heat of the day, important details, when God gives us details, he means to do so. At that time, Abram, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Now when he saw them, he ran from the entrance of his tent to meet them. And then bowed down low to the ground. So Abraham knew that these people that he saw coming, approaching him, was the Lord, accompanied by two angelic messengers. And the timing of their appearing was again intentional. It happened during the heat of of the day, probably around three o'clock in the afternoon, times in which it was the hottest, when Abraham would have been looking for shelter, and he was under the covering of his tent. They came at that point. And this nearly 100-year-old man, this was not a teenager or a young child or even a middle-aged individual. This is a well-seasoned man. When he saw that it was the Lord, he ran to them. When's the last time you ran for any reason? I, don't, I know very few 100-year-olds who run for anything. And yet, here is Abraham. He, when he saw that he knew it was the Lord, ran. And so when it comes to your communication and connection to God, do you run to him? Is a meeting with God something that your heart desires? Is there anticipation in your heart for your next meeting with God and desiring that it will come as quickly as it can? Do you have a desire to meet with him? Or is it dull or indifference about meeting with God? Probing questions.
questions. Now after, and Abraham saw it was the Lord, ran there, made effort, he was hot, he didn't care, he ran, he says he wanted to be with the Lord. And when he met him, he bowed low. So the question is, what is your and my posture towards God? Is it one of bowing and honor and respect to him? Or do we come to God through prayer, through his word, through worship, with a raised fist or a pointed finger? When we meet with him, is it one where we are looking at our watch, looking beyond our meeting to the next thing in our interactions with God? Do we have a heart posture of Hollywood be your name? Abraham. His heart was towards God. It was demonstrated by his desire to close the gap between him and God as quickly as possible, seen in running. And when he connected with him, he bowed low. And so I have to ask, where are you with him? Are you greatly anticipating the next interaction you have with him? And do we, when we meet with him, is it in such a posture that we bow to him in honor and admiration and respect? Abraham had a healthy heart towards God. How about me? How about you? Now, Abraham at this point had been walking with the Lord for at least 25 years. He had a tender, hungry, honoring love for God. That his desire was to be with him. Do you remember when you first came to Christ, if you are a Christian? (laughs) Remember what that was like for you. You might have been four or five or six years old. You might have been a teenager. You may have come to faith in Christ as an adult. What was that like for you? I grew up around the gospel. I prayed with my mom when I was young. High school was difficult for me with parents divorcing and moves after moves after moves and moves and financial difficulties and all the rest. But I remember when I first really, truly understood the gospel at 17, it changed me. I finally got the gospel and I never want to get over it. you you remember where are you now how is it now is our heart fire still stoked 20 40 60 years later or 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 has it kind of faded over time abraham's heart was towards god Wanted to meet with him, bowed low to him. Verse 3, we read this next interaction. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought. And then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat. So you can be refreshed and go on your way now that I have come, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you sight. Not presuming that things were okay. It's a humble posture. So grateful to be in God's presence. 
sometimes I think we interact with God that he should be grateful to be in our presence. That's not Abraham. There was a recognition that God could pass him by. He realized that Christ the Lord was doing his will on the earth. It was intentional that he came to him at this time, but that wasn't the final destination as we will see next week. Abraham realized it and said, don't pass me by. Reminds me of the leopards in the New uh, leper, not the leopards, <laughs> the lepers in the New Testament where Jesus was coming by and they cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do not pass me by. And there is a amazing sentence when Jesus was walking on the water and Mark describes that he intended to pass them by and they called out to him Jesus I have to ask myself is that the posture of our heart that we desire to meet with God And we catch a glimpse of him. We want so desperately to be with him. If I found favor in your sight, please stop. Do we presume upon God? Are we humble in his presence? Are we grateful for his meeting with us? Often I think, knowing my own heart, that's scandalous that God would give me even a moment of his time. The king of the universe, the creator of all things, the eternal Lord, wants to meet with you, wants to meet with me. Can you Fathom that. That's an appointment I don't want to miss. But how often we'll say, yeah, I'll meet with them on my time. I'll get to that when I get around to it. That, my friends, is a sign of spiritual sickness. And sometimes I have it as well. God, help us. God, Abraham saw himself as a servant of God, one who was under him. Abraham's desire was to serve the Lord, bless the Lord, honor the Lord, assist him in any way he could. That would be beneficial to what the Lord was doing. He recognized that God was active in his plans and he was honored to be with him. And didn't make himself the center of attention in God's plans. There's a lot in that sentence. So I have to ask myself, and I, we have to pause as a great physician, asks us questions. <laughs> Is our heart's desire to serve God and to bless Him, to honor Him, to play a positive part in His plans? And by the way, we can only do this by His grace. Or has our heart perhaps hardened towards him, thinking he is the one who, who should be serving me? You know how often we get that wrong? God, you do what I tell you to do, and if you don't, I'll be done with you. How dare we? <laughs> you understand who we're, you're talking to? Abraham understood 
who he is talking to. He saw an opportunity to meet with God. He ran, he bowed low, he said, let me serve you in any way that I can. Can I get something for you? Can I bless you? Here, how can I help what you're doing? I love this in the heart of Abraham. So the Lord said, okay, do what you plan to do. Now notice next what he does. He hurries into action. Verse 6 of chapter 18 of Genesis. So Abraham, you can underline these things, he hurried. Wasn't waiting around. He started at a quick pace. He hurried into the tent to Sarah said, quick, quickly, circle that. He went, he said, get three sheaths of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. After he interacted with her, guess what he did? Then he ran, not wanting to de- delay this, not desiring to just take his time and kind of linger. He ran a hundred-year-old man in the heat of the day to the herd and selected a choice, tender calf and gave it to his servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while he ate, he stood near them under a tree. So do you notice how quickly Abraham put his plan into action? Hurried, quick, ran, hurried. And I think all of this was done because of his desire to serve the Lord now. When we have opportunities to connect with God and to serve God, do is it again? Like, well, I'll do it when I have time, or yeah, okay, do I have to? Or really? I have to ask myself that question. Abraham dropped everything he did to give honor, respect, and love to God. Giving him the best he has, like an honored guest. Sometimes we have the privilege and opportunity to have people come to our home and they're passing through. What a joy it is to say, here, if you have an honored guest You can take our bed, and here is the best food we have, and how can we help you? How can we assist you? Is that our posture with Christ? It's a healthy heart, an honoring a heart, a connected heart, a heart that relates out of love for God. So how is it? How are you? How is your heart? How is your relationship with God? Where are you at with this? Now, after eating the meal, and Abraham was standing there as a servant, not even wanting this for himself, how can I honor and bless you and give you help and be connected to you. Not that God needs our help, but he does ask for our obedience. After eating this meal, the next interaction drew me to ask another diagnostic question about my and our spiritual health. How is your follow through with his word? Now you meddling, preacher. Even people with good hearts that love God coming to get us. Yes, they'd be here. (laughs) Gotta 
love State Street. I'm glad we're here. So now check this next um, interaction with Abraham. Okay? And I'll bring you to why I'm asking this question from this passage. Verse 9, after they had this meal, after Abraham expressed his heart, after that had been done, then the Lord turns to Abraham and asks them something curious. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. So, what kind of question is this? Right? Remember who's talking, right? <laughs> this is God. It's not like he needed the information as to where he was. I believe he was asking them the question like he'd asked two other times in the book of Genesis. The first time when God asked the question was to Adam. Adam, where are you? Now he wasn't asking looking around, wondering where he was, like he somehow lost Adam. Okay. It was a question that pointed out that now that there had been some distance between us, Adam, you were hiding from me in your heart, in our relationship. Something has come in between us. Adam, where are you? It was in the vein that Adam could think and notice that there now, as there never had been distance, between him and God, and now there was. The second time God asked in Genesis about someone was to this young man named Cain, who had a brother named Abel. And Cain, if you know the story, killed his brother Abel, and God met, met with Cain. And God asked Cain a question. Cain, where is your brother Abel? God didn't need to know that information. He knew where Abel was. He was asking Cain, what did you do here? Okay. It's like me, before I go to work, when my kids were small, telling my two young children, when you're done, with your bicycles, make sure you put them back in the garage. And then as I return home, seeing them laying in their front yard, driving into my garage, going into the house, and then asking my girls a question. Girls, where are your bikes? You guys understand this question? not in that instance that I was wondering where they were. I knew where they were. I wanted to remind them about our previous conversation. I believe it is in that light that God asked Abraham, hey, Abraham, where's your wife Sarah? Where is she? Sarah and the in the tent, he said. Verse 10a, first part. Now the Lord said, and I imagine he said it, because <laughs> we know from the next couple of verses that Abraham's tent was right behind him, right? Close by. It wasn't over there. It's over, over there. Okay. I imagine God turning to Abraham, bringing Abraham's attention to where his wife was in that relationship, perhaps speaking up a little loudly. I will re surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, this is not new information to Abraham because God had already told him explicitly the last time they were together, which was within three months, that what was going to happen. And I believe that Abraham failed to tell this information to Sarah 
because God came out of his way to tell him this. He was going to Sodom, which was a long walk from there, making sure that she knew the timing of the communication which was before she was pregnant, she needed to know this, that it wasn't by accident or physical means that she would become pregnant, but because of God's promise. How he addresses Abraham. Where is your wife, Abraham? Versus calling to her. He says, Abraham, you had a responsibility here to tell her these things. And we'll see again, he addresses Abraham, calling Abraham to responsibility for not communicating and also how Sarah responds to hearing the news. She laughed to herself in a doubtful way. So God, I believe, is holding Abraham accountable for her response, asking him a direct question. Abraham Where's your wife, Sarah? Let me remind you in her hearing, let me do this, your responsibility, communicate to her that this promise is coming through your and her body. Abraham, perhaps, was scared to follow up with God's word and communication, because the last time he told her a child was going to be born, it didn't turn out well. It may have reminded her that she was barren. For whatever reason, he didn't tell her this piece of information. He told the other pieces to his men, hey, we're going to get circumcised is what God has done. But he failed to communicate following through. Now Sarah, verse 10, second part of this, was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. It's a great bring emphasis again to this point. So Sarah laughed to herself. <laughs> right. And she thought, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, so here she is behind the tent. He told him as he was telling her, Abraham, where's your wife? She heard it. She bit her tongue and laughed her and thought to herself, Way. Then the Lord said to who? Abraham. He said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Abraham probably didn't know she laughed, and certainly he didn't know her thoughts. But yet, God held Abraham responsible for communicating his word, for connecting with his wife to help her, per se, in her heart. Abraham, why why did Sarah laugh? Abraham, why, why did she laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year. And Sarah will have a son. Now this phrase, is anything too hard for the Lord, appears three times in Scripture. First time is here, and it's always in the context of restoration, redemption. First time is here. I promise you, you have a child, and you laugh. What, is anything too hard for me? 
I know you're old. I know you have been physically un, been unable to produce an offspring, but that is no problem for me in fulfilling my promise to you, Abraham and Sarah. Another time when this is brought forward is in the book of Jeremiah, when the whole um, community of Israel had fallen away from God, and God allowed and actually directed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and to wipe them out and take them to captivity. And God spoke to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, buy a piece of property here, because you're going to come back. I know it looks impossible, but nothing is impossible With me, I will fulfill my promise to you. The third time that this came up in Scripture, actually there's four times, the third time is when God talked to another woman who had not been with a man. You might have heard her. Her name is Mary. And God said, this promise is coming, and her response was different than Sarah's. She asked, how can this be that the Holy Spirit will come upon you? You will conceive. I'm fulfilling my promise and nothing is impossible with me. She said, so be it unto me as you proclaim to me. The fourth time has to deal with salvation, where Jesus was teaching and talking about it's easier for a, a, um, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven it's like a camel going through an eye of a needle, and that's a whole different message. And the dis- disciples asked him, well, it's impossible for people to be saved. And he says, nothing is impossible with God. He is the one who saves and does the impossible. He is the one who fulfills his word. Is anything too hard for the Lord, and I'm not going to offer you false hope today. The message I wanted to speak was, is anything too hot possible for the Lord? And we can connect it, and, want, and, and we should continue to believe and walk in faith. But we can trust God for the promises He has given to us in His Word, and you can say amen to that. What does He promise you to do? He will never leave you nor forsake you. He may heal you, but he may wait to heal you until the resurrection of the dead. Hear me. I said that intentionally. Anything too hard for the Lord? When it comes to God being able to fulfill his promises to us, there is nothing and no one who or will stop him. No one, no supernatural power, no governmental kingdom, even death itself. This is the God that we God knows our thoughts and the word of the Lord will stand when God says something to you through his word we have a responsibility to him and to it so I have to ask the spiritual diagnostic question again how are you following through what God has told you to do. Are we responsive to him and responsible for what he tells us to do? Perhaps you're doing well in some areas. Perhaps you're doing well in all areas. Perhaps we're really struggling and following through, hurting ourselves and hindering others. How are you doing with that? How am I doing that with that? One final diagnostic question. Are you being honest with God? 
Are you being honest with God? Are you being honest with yourself? Are you being honest with others? <laughs> So at some point in this conversation between the Lord and Abram, or Abraham coming to him, asking him, connecting, rebuking in some regards, this conversation in which Sarah was meant to intentionally overhear, she must have come out at some point and tried to cover for Abraham and herself. <laughs> and so the text reads, verse 15, Sarah was afraid. So what did she do? She lied. And said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> but the Lord said, um, yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did laugh. <laughs> I'm going to cut her a little slack. Maybe she didn't know quite who this was. But you can't lie to God. Have you tried to do that before? <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm good. I love you. Did you do that, Dave? No, I did not. No. No, I did not. Right? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> he comes to us as a good father, right? right? Because he loves us. That's why we ask these questions. Because I love you. That's why I'm asking you these questions. Sarah and Abraham did have a lying problem, by the way. You guys know this? We saw it once already. <laughs> kind of saw a little twisting with Hagar. We're going to see it again, actually, in a couple weeks, <laughs> where they lied again. Right. We'll even see it generationally, as this promised son lies just like his parents. And by the way, lying often isn't the problem. Often it's the symptom of a problem. Often the problem is we're afraid of the truth. You never have to be afraid of the truth with God. There's consequences, yes, but he asks us to redeem us, not to condemn us. Did you hear that? Redeem us. Help us. Pull like a thorn out of us. So we addressed her. So we have to ask, are we being honest? No one goes to the doctor with a broken b bone and, say, and they ask, how are you doing? I'm fine. Right? I don't want to tell the doctor because I would be embarrassed that I have a broken bone. That's just is stupid. Right? We, when he says, hey, what's happening? We say, hey really hurts right here. <laughs> How is it that we go to the great physician? How are you doing? I'm fine. When you ain't fine. Just be honest. <laughs> he knows anyway. He's like, wow, I didn't know that. You're talking to God. So it's better just to be honest. He can handle your situation. God, I got a tough one for you. I don't know if you can handle it. Who do you think you're talking to? You guys understand this? So this is how we're going to conclude. Musicians can come up. That'd be awesome. We're going to see next week, and next week we're going to take a bigger chunk of dealing with Sodom. And all of that, pretty bad. It's actually, part of it's disgusting. I'm going to talk about it next week, but this is how we're going to end today. We're going to put these three questions on the screen. If you could do that, please. If you can read those. And we're going to spend some time just reflecting, okay? You can just pray something quietly and Give it a minute or two. I don't know. Whenever, you, Rob, you think it's right to go in the next song. And this is what I want you to do, okay? I want you to think about the three questions we talked about. And I'm asking you during this time that you quiet your heart. 
Quiet your heart. Quiet your mind, probably. <laughs> Open your heart and ask God these questions. As God asks us these questions, how is your relationship with God? How is your follow-through with his word? And are you being honest <laughs> with God, yourself, and others? My prayer is that he will speak to our hearts. And some of you just are going to be encouraged to say, hey, keep going, keep doing it. Some of us, it's going to be a little harder. But I trust all of us will meet with him. And so I'm going to, I'm going to pray for us. And then after that, I'm just going to ask you just to don't connect with anybody around you, right? Whatever you need to do, if you need to kneel, if you want to come up here, great. If you want to be quiet, bow your head, close your eyes, whatever. Okay. God, thank you this morning. That we can gather around your word in hopes and knowing that you love us. And as our great Father, as our great friend, as our great Lord, you help us. And God, as we contemplate our relationship with you and our heart towards you today, God, I ask through your Holy Spirit that you meet with everybody here, every single person here. Help us to know, help us to heal, help us to hear. Will you speak to our hearts? Will you help us with our follow-through? Will you help us and guide us and care for us? Thank you that you love us enough to come to us, to speak to us. to search for us. God, I ask that we would hear you today. May you be honored in our hearts. Evidenced by how we choose to interact with you and the, this world. Have your way in us, we ask in Jesus' name.